Good morning, welcome to The View. The eyes of the entire world are locked on Israel right now. They declared war for the first time in 50 years after a barrage of attacks by terrorist organization Hamas. And we're getting the very latest from ABC News foreign, co News foreign correspondent James Longman, who is live from Tel Aviv. Good morning, James. Good morning, Whoopi. You've been on the ground in Tel Aviv over the last 48 hours. Give us the latest since this unprecedented attack happened on Saturday. Well, if uh, the full-scale response from Israel to Hamas's terrorist attack hadn't already got underway, then it feels very, very imminent. We've been hearing the relentless bombardment over Gaza. It started almost immediately after that Saturday morning attack, but now in the last few hours it really has ramped up. We've heard uh, a particular refugee camp in, in, pa in the uh, Gaza Strip was hit earlier this morning. Palestinian health authorities uh, say dozens were killed there, and possibly the death toll there is reaching 600 uh, at this point, and that's even before a single Israeli soldier has stepped foot into the Gaza Strip. That's what most people are expecting, some kind of ground invasion. Remember, they're responding to this unprecedented terror attack by Hamas militants. We understand at least 700 Israelis were killed in that attack, but that number is likely to rise because there are so many missing, so many unaccounted for. We did hear earlier this morning that the Israelis have brought under control the area next to the Gaza Strip, these uh, communities that were invaded essentially by these Hamas militants, where people were shot in the street as they went around uh, their morning routine, shot some of them in their cars. People were shot even in their own homes. And so the full scale, the full, I, I think the full reality of what actually happened in those communities isn't yet fully clear. But the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, say they have now brought the south under control. They're ready to act in Gaza. That, the Gaza Strip is been sealed. They call it under total siege. Uh, and now people inside the Strip are waiting to see what their fate holds. Guys? James, I'm grateful to you and to all the other journalists who are there showing the world the horrors of this atrocity. You know, I, I watch news so much and sometimes I feel numb to it. This is the first time I remember in a long time that brought tears to my eyes because what we are seeing, the suffering we are seeing, is just unjustifiable. But my question is, there have been over 1,200 total deaths reported so far, including at least nine U.S. citizens in Israel. We've also heard of over 100 others kidnapped and held hostage by Hamas, including women, children, the elderly, disabled, Holocaust survivors. What is the latest on the efforts to locate and release these hostages? You're right, they were some of the most harrowing images uh, to, to see. Uh, young women being grabbed uh, from the party they were at. There was a desert festival going on near the border with Gaza when suddenly uh, these terrorists arrived. Women being grabbed, put on the back of motorbikes. Uh, the elderly, as you say, young children. There were toddlers who have been taken hostage as well. At the moment, we understand, we believe, many of them might be in Gaza. It's very difficult to verify that, but that is what Hamas said. They said they had dozens uh, of hostages. The separate terrorist group, Islamic Jihad, also claimed to have taken hostages. Getting them out of Gaza at this point is incredibly difficult. This is one of the most densely populated places on Earth. Two and a half million people live in Gaza, uh, and it's going to be difficult enough for the Israelis to respond to this terror attack, let alone find these hostages, many of whom may have been split up. They may have moved them around inside the territory in order to make it difficult to find them, maybe even using them as human shields. So we don't have an update on what the Israelis are intending to do about the hostages. That is presumably classified at this point. Certainly the families are desperate, desperate that some of them may be brought out. Faint hope, perhaps, a negotiation can be made for some of the most uh, vulnerable, some of the elderly, some of the babies, maybe. Who knows? But at this point, it's anyone's guess. The families, though, of course, of course, they're hoping that that happens. James, yesterday you spoke with the mother of a 22-year-old who was at the music festival where at least 260 people were br brutally massacred. She had yet to hear of her daughter's fate, and you asked how she was dealing with this unimaginable situation. Unimaginable situation. Let's take a quick look. And as a mother, can you, can you try and just describe what it's like waiting for news? You can't sleep. Uh, all I can think about is where she is, if she's suffering, if she's still alive. I just want her back. I have three daughters. I can't imagine my life without Kim.
Now, can you give us a sense of what the people that you've been speaking on, to on the ground are feeling right now? Jennifer, who you heard from there, broke my heart. We were sat across from her in her family home. She sat between her two daughters, her older daughters, uh, and she heard news on Saturday morning from Kim, 22-year-old, beautiful young girl, blonde hair, curly blonde hair, green eyes, out partying with her friends at this desert uh, festival when she got a call, Kim, uh, Jennifer got a call from Kim saying the rockets have started, what do I do? Uh, they told her to run, to hide if she could, and that was the last they heard from her. I mean, this has just been completely de soul-destroying for these families. Uh, Jennifer told me that her husband was going from hospital to hospital with her hairbrush, with her hair still in it, going to places to try to see if they've got a DNA match for her dead body. They don't know what's happened to her, and they're likely not going to get any answers for some time because of the scale of death and the numbers who are still missing. I mean, imagine having to choose between whether your daughter has died or whether she's been taken into Gaza. And I spoke to another family uh, whose young girl, 19-year-old, a young IDF recruit, she was abducted. And we actually have video of, uh, of this woman, uh, Karina, being taken into Gaza. Her mother sat distraught, tears down her face, she's basically dazed. And her, young, her other daughter, Sasha, 24 years old, beautiful young girl, I was struck by just how uh, much poise she had when she spoke to me. She said they got a call in her final moments when she said goodbye. She said, I'm going into Gaza, this must be goodbye. And Sasha said she felt she had to remain strong for her parents. Uh, but it has been uh, unspeakable, really, for Israelis to watch this happening. James, this was a highly coordinated and wide-scale attack by Hamas. What do we know about the timing of this, and what was the impetus for this to happen now? Well, I've been to this country many times, just this year, four times alone, often to report on terrorist attacks by Palestinians in the occupied East Jerusalem or in the West Bank. Uh, and there's been a lot of tension. I have to say most of that tension has been focused on the West Bank, uh, restive camps where the Palestinian Authority has basically lost control to terror groups, uh, and also been here because of the political turmoil, the most right-wing government in this country's history, and a sense, perhaps, for many Palestinians that any kind of political way out of this is uh, behind them, because some of the right-wing elements of the government here have been very incendiary in their rhetoric about Palestinians. I think we also can't overlook uh, the fact that Iran is watching what's happening in this region and the possible normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Iran and Saudi Arabia, massive regional adversaries. It is within Iran's, uh, it is what Iran wants to see any kind of normalization ended. So there are all kinds of reasons why now. But honestly, uh, no one knows just how Hamas managed to plan this for so long and carry it out on such a widespread scale. Uh, but the recriminations and, and, and the questions, they will come. But for the moment, these pal Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are waiting to see what the response will be. Guys. And James, uh, our hearts are breaking across America. I'm just struck by the fact that on Saturday alone, 200 Jews were killed, the most in a single day since the Holocaust. Um, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has warned of a long and difficult war to come. And President Biden has strongly reaffirmed U.S. support for Israel and plans to send additional military assistance in the coming days. How much more of a role can we expect the U.S. to play in this conflict in the immediate future? Well, there's already plans underfoot to support them uh, militarily in some uh, ways. The, the U.S.'s most advanced uh, aircraft carrier has been moved into the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, that is a show of support. Also increased uh, munitions, ammunition perhaps, we don't know what exactly for, but perhaps for uh, the Iron Dome system that keeps uh, Israel safe from Hamas rockets. This building behind me, by the way, was struck uh, just the other night uh, by one of those rockets, and, and it remains, and it has always been a major fear for Israelis. So uh, these are the material ways that Israel uh, will want help from, from the United States. But as this moves forward, they're going to want diplomatic cover from America because what, we don't know what's going to transpire in Gaza, but sealing off the entire Gaza Strip, the 2.3 million people there from food, from water, from electricity, uh, that is incredibly controversial and will, uh, we will see, I would imagine, criticism from the international community about that. So over and above material help uh, from the United States, I think what Israel will want will be political cover as well. And James, let me ask you, how much concern is there about this conflict expanding throughout the region, whether Hezbollah, Lebanon to the north or other Iranian proxies? 
I think that's a, a massive concern, and we saw it, you know, just yesterday. There was an exchange of mortar fire in the north here between what we assume were Hezbollah elements uh, and uh, the uh, Israeli defense forces. And then today we heard that there was even an incursion, a small group of people moving in to northern Israel from Lebanon. We don't know if they were Palestinian, uh, um, his Hezbollah operatives. We understand possibly they may have been Palestinian, but that has not been confirmed. But of course, a wider regional escalation, that is the major, major concern here. You've got Hezbollah in the north, you've got the Iranians watching, uh, and the entire region on edge, wondering just what might happen if this gets really, really out of hand. Guys. James, I can't believe this would be the last time we'll be talking to you in the upcoming days. So thank you for being with us today, and I'm sure we'll be speaking to you again.